So, um, good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to the first uh, DevConf Lightning Talk session. Uh, we have 45 minutes to do this, and we have nine different talks that are going to try to fit in this time. We have seven different speakers. Um, so I'd like to ask you to hold questions to the end of the session. If we have a little bit of extra time, we'll, have, we'll try to answer questions then, or you can just pull somebody aside in person. And um, in case anybody doesn't really understand what a lightning talk is, it's just a very short talk, about five minutes long. So um, I hope we all don't talk too fast, and I hope you enjoy it. And I'll start off with Jeroen, who has the first talk. Thank you. Um, I'm uh, Jeroen van Wolflaag, and I'm uh, talking now uh, this five minutes about uh, actively discovering bugs and issues with packages. Um, one of the, the a lot of bugs in Debian packages, there will always be bugs. Uh, and of those bugs that are not actually uh, discovered by a maintainer or by a user, needs to be, uh, can be discovered by maybe some automatic fashion. Uh, a few of those famous examples are actually um, the Lintian uh, checks of the whole archive. Um, or the PO parts run by Lars Visenius, or um, various people who are trying to build all the packages regularly in the archive to see whether they are still buildable. There are just a few problems with uh, those, this uh, approach. Uh, the, one of the things is, uh, of all those different efforts, it's a bit uncoordinated. Uh, various people are doing things. Um, without there being one single uh, source of information, uh, which means uh, a certain amount of duplicated effort. Uh, also, it's quite hard to add new tests to this. Uh, there are two main reasons. Uh, one is it requires quite some resources, hardware, to add a new test, but specifically also the infrastructure. Um, every time you want to run a test over the whole archive, you need to make sure uh, you have a way to run it on the whole archive, that you present results by some way, etc., etc. Um, this can be quite prohibitive to add new tests, even if you have a nice idea to do so. Uh, and also, yeah, because of the not being very coordinated, um, you'll uh, have a hard time as maintainer, for example, to find out what is the results of all those tests that is going on with my package. Uh, what's there the result? What's the status of it? Um, well, I think uh, this would be very worthwhile to look for a better way uh, on that. Uh, and here comes uh, the MOL system in. MOL is a QA project. Um, the intention of it is, uh, the design is that you can add uh, very easily uh, tests. Uh, by adding those tests, uh, is because the infrastructure is already existing, you can add uh, simply a file describing what kind of test it is. And uh, the workers that are going to actually perform the test simply need to know how it works. Um, be including in the infrastructure will be a website where you, for example, maintainer-based can see uh, what is the result of all those tests, etc., that have been run over my package. For example, uh, does my package currently build? Does my package currently build under pbuilder? Um, does the package self-tests, once that uh, is, is there is an infrastructure for it, does that work? Um, Next to the web interface is also, of course, a raw interface, a file system based, so that uh, the data can be automatically <coughs> uh, parsed and automatically used in maybe different tests or different uh, things. Uh, the result submission of when you have, uh, someone has a test running on the archive and it doesn't need to be by some QA person, basically anyone can introduce a test of whatever nature. Uh, the submission will be by email and therefore uh, enter the, the infrastructure and the system. So logs will also be available over there. Basically quite parallel to how the building infrastructure works. 
Um, and optionally, uh, this infrastructure can also provide a work distribution by simply indicating uh, which packages need to be tested, maybe retested if uh, it's a type of test that depends on uh, the contents of the archive, um, etc. But it's not really required to use it. If you, you run your own uh, distribution of work, that's also possible. Um, and this would hopefully allow for a lot of extra tests to be added. Uh, if you're interested in helping out, please email uh, debianqa at lists.debian.org. And, well, one of the random things that is, uh, for example, uh, maybe possible by this is uh, collecting data of what symbols are exported by each libraries. Uh, then finding out and using the raw interface again to run a new test on that and then find out which uh, programs might uh, be conflicting with each other because the symbols are actually clashing with each other. Okay, thank you very much. Jose, where's Jose? He's not there. I, oh, okay. Thanks, I'm Jose Barrella from Debian Venezuela. This uh, speak is a country independent talk uh, willing to provide some ideas on uh, how to combine people with power to use Debian because making your country love Debian is a matter of convincing the people with power to use it. So uh, the first stuff about dealing with people with power is to handle their closed minds with solid arguments. People with power usually have stupid arguments and especially if they are um, uh, related to other free software projects, like for example, uh, the Red Hat project in Venezuela, we have several people related to that project and they usually make the war with the Debian community uh, about the arguments we use to convince the people with power. So the first argument they use is the lack of support. And the first lesson I'm willing to give you is to uh, respond to an argument with a better argument. So for example, when they say that uh, Debian lacks support, you can say that Debian has two types of support. It has commercial support through enterprises and individuals, and it has non-commercial support. For example, you can do auto support if you go to the book tracking system or the package tracking system, or if you ask on the mailing list or IRC channels. In Venezuela, we have at least four uh, enterprises doing support to Debian. That means you can call them and, and tell them you have a problem with Genome and they solve it to you. Uh, of course, it's a commercial support. Uh, also, it's important to tell them that Debian or the developership in Debian has a social nature. For example, we're all here because of our social nature. And also, uh, you can use the resources Debian has uh, to provide more solid arguments. For example, uh, uh, nobody thinks that Planet Debian could be exploitable to make people uh, convince, convince people to use Debian. But you can tell people that you can uh, know about developers' life in the Planet Debian, or you can browse through their blogs, or you can see iGAR's photographs in a, in a web page. And uh, all that stuff is good because uh, people usually don't have contact with the developers of their programs. Also, there are dozens of non-government organizations using Debian. We have to update the Debian webpage about the who's using Debian webpage. Needs a really good update because uh, I only see uh, one university in almost every country of Europe, but I think that uh, number is uh, higher. Uh, also, a university in almost every continent uses Debian, government organizations, and if your country is left-wing like mine, uh, you can tell them that Greenpeace or blood banks or uh, internet social access centers in, the, in countries use Debian. Uh, it's not ethical to use uh, arguments for left and right wing governments, but it's a tough word. Uh, you can also uh, provide them the maps of the user and developers, uh, maps that are made with XPlanet in the, in the Debian webpage, so they can see where is the people using Debian and all that stuff. Uh, you need to have local developers, for example, in nationalistic countries like mine, they need to have Venezuelan people working on Debian. Uh, we're working on that also, but you need to have local developers. You need to tell them that we have documentation, and it's not a documentation like in the Fedora or Red Hat project. It's an academic documentation. Uh, for example, the Martin Craft book, the Debian Bible, or other documents like uh, Securing Debian from Javier Fernandez. And um, this provides a harness for all the theoretical holes that might come in the distribution. You can say 
hey, there's text, there's theoretical stuff that provides uh, a workaround for them. You can also uh, provide information about Debian.net, backports, sponsorships, Alliot, or apt-get.org that are all community provided services for Debian. So in Venezuela, uh, we have a, 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 this, uh, a, an unfair advantage over other countries because we have a law that states that uh, we have to use free software. So people in Venezuela usually say that the Debian community doesn't give freedom to the users because we always tell them to use Debian. But we give them freedom because they can use Sarge, Edge, or Seed. <laughs> now it's my turn. I'm Andreas Schuldai. I will talk about uh, Debian's role in the general Linux ecosystem. I noticed a recent change in um, uh, the attitude of big multinational inter independent software vendors recently when um, they noticed that their current choices of um, certified platforms like SUSE or Red Hat were not as um, good as they wished anymore because Red Hat becomes more of a competitor now, now that Red Hat moves into the um, middleware market. And these companies do not want to um, support, no, well, support perhaps, but um, not uh, further uh, their competitors. And the other um, alternative, SUSE, is not doing all that great. Actually, SUSE's market share is declining, and um, Debian's, for example, is still rising. Um, and they are looking for additions or uh, alternatives now. And on the other hand side, they have a problem because the certification of their software to uh, platforms is really expensive. Um, and it's not cheaper to, um, yeah, well, it's e as expensive to add another Linux distro to the supported base um, as, for example, adding li uh, Windows, for example. It's, yeah, well, and so for that reason, they would like to reduce the supported um, platforms rather than to extend them. Their hope and their um, plan, whatever, is that Debian becomes LSB compliant and that um, we are, will be able to become fully LSB compliant and all the other distros might at some point do, be the same. Then they could just um, uh, do one distro which they would support and that would be LSB. We are in a very sweet sp spot right now because our release managers are willing to make uh, LSB bugs release critical. Um, and uh, if given that the LSB community or workers commit to long-term support too, and um, that would make, <laughs> that would make uh, Debian uh, suddenly a first-class citizen in the um, uh, yeah, well, Linux ecosystem regarding support and uh, and yeah, and, and, and we, we would be much closer to world domination all of a, all of a sudden. Um, that brings me right to my next point. That's the community. Debian has a very lively and active community, and it's growing. Um, and we, and I think that research has shown that that Debian and uh, also Linux in general are doing so well because of their. Um, community. That is the edge that Linux has over commercial um, entities. And um, I think that the great challenge and the, yeah, that, that we are facing right now is to have a community that is, uh, to, to, to improve our community and further it in a way that it is able to compete with other Linux distros and projects. We need to attract the smartest and brightest and best and socially apt people that we can get. For that, we need, we need to be also more attractive than other dis distributions or um, Linux projects. And um, we, I think the key, key points to that are um, to be uh, the other, and I mentioned those in my platform last two, last two years. Um, loving relationships, 
and um, uh, empowering leadership and small groups in, able, uh, in order to become scalable. Finally, I want to mention embedded systems. Debian is market, market leader in embedded systems and by a good margin. There are um, competitors which just repackage Debian packages into RPMs and ship them and um, they make money on this but Debian is still bigger. Please um, help our embedded systems developers to um, make Debian more attractive to embedded systems even, to, uh, to, em to embedded systems vendors and producers in, and, and help them to roll in the work that they are doing into the main Debian packages. Thank you. Who's next? It's, it's, it's Thank you. Well, hello, my name is David Moreno Garza. I'm talking about the WMPP books and how we are working in this non very uh, attended area. Firstly, obviously, what are the N N w uh, WMPP books? Well, these are just a kind of books which are related to the uh, WMPP met uh, pseudo package. Uh, we need to standardize all the WMPP thing because everything around it is a mess. I mean, uh, all the uh, all the uh, processes we are doing around him, all the reports, all the. Uh, the, the people, all, uh, everything is a mess, so we have to standardize it. Uh, yeah, well, uh, we have a huge, a huge number of WMPP books. We have, in total, uh, 4,890 books, uh, both, both closed and opened, I mean, in the whole uh, BTS history, uh, but right now we have 1,800 uh, open books, which I think is like the the package with more books in the BTS. Obviously, it's not, you know, like the same kind of books, but anyway. Uh, so we started, at least uh, all, uh, some of the people I asked and me, started to do some closings of unneeded uh, books in... Uh, we started to review the ITPs and the RFP, uh, RFPs. Uh, so if, if one of these has one year old, we just close it, one year old of inactivity, I mean. Uh, and how do, uh, how do we do this? By parsing all the inbox of the, uh, of the book and read for the last uh, line starting with date colon, which is some kind of ugly, but it works most of the times. Uh, so in total, we have closed 768 ITPs until now. We do, it, we do this every week. Every week. Um, and we also uh, review the RFPs, and we have closed 848 until today. Uh, and we also work in the ITAs, which are not closed, but retitled into orphans. And well, until now, we have only one retitle, which is nice because uh, this uh, shows that the uh, ITAs are quite uh, attended by the people. I mean, they are not, uh, they are not left alone. Uh, so, um, well, the ITAs uh, are retitled after 250 days of, of inactivity. We also are doing... Uh, a page with grong title WMPPs, which means uh, in, in, in our goal to standardize some process, we are trying to every, every uh, WMPP book to have it uh, a title like uh, ATP colon uh, space, then the, the, the name of the package, space dash dash, uh, uh, sorry, main, minus minus uh, space and the description of the package. Even if for 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 all the uh, all the books, I mean, uh, uh, requests for helps or fans, all of them, um, and we have 
at least one person working retitle re retitle this, which uh, who is Marcela Tisnado, who is uh, she likes to 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 check the page and retitle all the books uh, all the books reported. Yeah. Um, well, and some other uh, interesting things. Report book doesn't handle the correct titles in the uh, in the Orphaneth books. When when you report uh, a book in report book to Orphaneth thing, it only displays uh, the title as O colon space and the name of the package, and it doesn't show the description. Well, um, you can use also WMPP alert, which is a very nice tool developed by Arthur Korn. And well, more people are working in the WMPP uh, thing. Mate Bella is, uh, well, somewhere, uh, working on pinging on ITP's authors. He does this work uh, uh, quite often. And well, Martin, Martin Michelmeyer uh, doing a weekly reports. And well, I think uh, we could uh, help a bit by hacking the BTS to LDAP gateway, which is a very nice tool for most of the things in the BTS. Thank you. Hi, I'm Raphael Herzog, and I will speak about collaborative maintenance. It's something that I'm trying to push forward for a few years, and uh, I will start by explaining what we're, where we are today and where we could go. And well, right now, c what is collaborative maintenance? For me, it's several persons working on one or more packages. It's rather vague. I, I don't mean. Debian developers, I say person, people, don't care who. Usually they use a version control system or something similar to work together on the package at least. And of course, they need a common communication channel. I don't specify which one yet. In the standard model, right now it's an alias project, a subversion repository, and a mailing list. It works very well for a team like PKG GNOME. They have many maintainers, many different packages, and they are all highly visible packages. So the, the, the persons on the team want to have good packages and care a lot about all the packages. So this works well, and we have everything needed to make it work, so that's fine. Now we have a second model of collaborative maintenance, which I call low maintenance model. It's something for, for example, well, uh, that we do with PKG Perl or Python models. I mean, we have lots of lo and lots of packages which are one Python model or one Perl model, which are doing many different things. I mean, in the repository, we'll find s s models for desktop, models for servers, models for scripting, whatever. So there's there's no common feeling of a shared goal except improving Perl in general. So that usually means that we don't care about all the models that are in the repository, and we don't usually look at them carefully. And sometimes it happens that some of them get forgotten and get a bit more, bit rot a bit uh, over time. So what we need is a kind of uh, overview. Uh, this is partly achieved with the DDPO web pages. Since the team is in the, in the, in the maintenance field or uploaders field, you can have a good overview of all the packages and check if bugs are coming and coming and, and when they are not fixed. You can also check if there's a new option version that you've forgotten and stuff like that. This works quite well as well today. So my idea is, is Oh, in this low maintenance model as well, it's always people who are uh, Debian maintainers, Debian developers. But my third idea was a kind of collaborative maintenance with people outside of Debian. And it's kind of a similar idea with the Debian maintainers that we have. We want to, to have help of external contributors uh, because we have lots of packages where 
we don't have uh, enough DD who are experts in that package and which could maintain it over a long time. So collaborative maintenance could also be uh, maintaining between a sponsor, which is a Debian developer, and an expert in a package which is external to it. Uh, of course, to make this work, we need quite a bit of infrastructure. And this is all which is about, uh, this is the goal of the collab dash main alias project that I created. Some of you have already seen that uh, in the recent announce that I sent to Debian Devil Announce. We have possibilities to do that now because we have, we can have many different projects, diff many totally unrelated projects in the same uh, repository as long as we have a single communication channel per package which could be the PTS in our case. And uh, well, on top of that we need to uh, add a lot of QA tools to be able to check the work of our external contributors. And this is where the, we need a kind of web, web interface where each external maintainer could just request to upload when needed. And uh, the web interface would also show quite a lot of uh, quality information like bit logs of the latest uh, um, snapshot of the source code and stuff like that. And yeah, uh, I'm almost done. So if you're in interested to work on that, please mail me and join collab dash main on Elliot. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm Matt Taggart. One of the things I do for the Debian project is that I am a local administrator for some uh, Debian.org machines, and uh, I'm going to talk about how to get uh, Debian admin to help you. Okay, so first I should describe um, who I'm talking about when I talk about Debian admin, uh, because it's actually um, uh, kind of confusing. Um, there is the Debian system administration team, and this consists of uh, Elmo and Neuro and uh, Joey and Phil. Um, and their uh, email is uh, debian-admin at debian.org. Um, now there is also a debian-admin at list.debian.org address, and that consists of the Debian sysadmin team, uh, plus all the local administrators for those machines. The machines are hosted uh, all around the world, um, and they need to have local administrators um, in case something goes wrong. Um, so there are four people on the, on, in the DSA team, but there are 11 people on the Debian admin list. Um, and uh, when sending requests uh, related to machines or uh, true requests, those sort of things, it's, it's better to use the list address because there are uh, more people there that uh, will be able to fill uh, your request. Okay, so um, when making requests, um, the best way to get a response is to make it uh, very easy to fulfill your request. So um, this means uh, researching the problem ahead of time and providing um, specific uh, needed information. Um, also ask clear questions. If you send something that's very vague and, and isn't a, a direct question or, or pointing out a direct problem, uh, it's hard for the Debian admin team to, to figure out what you're talking about. Um, the Debian admin team, like uh, uh, everybody else in Debian, is busy. If, if the request is clear um, and easy to fulfill, it will often be done right away. Um, if it's vague or additional information is needed and, and uh, that would require um, sending email, um, that might get put off till later. Um, you want to avoid uh, the need for back and forth emails. If you don't provide all the information, that's going to require the Debian admin team to send mail back to you um, requesting more information and, and uh, uh, these turnaround cycles uh, add a lot of time. Um, the other thing too is also uh, avoid adding unneeded information uh, or attitude. I've, I've seen requests that say, well, you're, you're probably not going to do this, but I need you to do something, and that kind of attitude is, is one of the best ways to get Debian admin to not help you. Okay, so the Debian admin team um, is able to deal with Debian.org uh, machine system administration issues, you know, running out of disk space or, or processes run amok. Um, also able to uh, deal with uh, Chiroot install requests, you know, you need something installed on a developer Chiroot. Um, or in general, machi machine usage questions. So say uh, you want to run a cron job that um, does some QA-related activity or that kind of thing. You should contact Debian Admin about 
uh, what, if it's appropriate to do that sort of thing and, and what machine to do it on, um, and also maybe to uh, look at the code to, to make sure it's doing things efficiently. Okay, uh, there are a lot of things that people send requests to Debian Admin about um, that Debian Admin can't help with, and so uh, this is just going to slow down the process and cause Debian Admin to have to, uh, um, to reply to you and tell you that you need to contact somewhere else. Um, in particular, uh, Alioth requests need to go to uh, the Alioth administrators. Even though it's a Debian.org machine, um, that is such a special service that there are a group of people that maintain that separately. Um, they also have a uh, IRC channel that um, the administrators hang out in that you can ask questions there. Um, anything having to do with the archive is, is not something Debian admin can generally help with, um, so you should contact FTP master. Um, you know, and likewise for the bug tracking system and lists and, and web related issues, um, Debian admin doesn't do those, so any request sent to Debian admin will um, uh, just have to be forwarded on and, and will take it a while, take longer for you to get an answer. Okay, so I wanted to go into a little bit more deal about cheroot requests because this is probably the thing that Debian admin gets asked most about. Um, so some of these things are going to sound like common sense, but you'd be amazed at how often people uh, um, don't think to do this. So the first thing you need to do when making a cheroot request is check the machine first and make sure that the things that you need aren't already there. Um, we get a lot of cheroot requests, and, and in general, the machines um, already have a lot of, um, of development packages installed. So check first, and then... Uh, if there's anything missing that you need, um, just ask for the missing packages. Um, you need to specify uh, which machine and which root you're talking about. Um, it's kind of funny when requests come in and, and uh, to install packages and they don't have this because, you know, Debian admin can't read your mind and doesn't know uh, which machine you're talking about. Um, the other thing that makes uh, things easier is uh, when you send the list of packages that you want, um, send them as a space separated list um, and so that means you can't just cut and paste um, the depends from the package because it will often have commas or versioned uh, dependency information so take that out make it easy to cut and paste and the request will be easier to fulfill. Um, additional information is optional but it may help if there are issues if Debian admin is trying to install um, packages for you and something's not installable if you if you provide additional information that might help. Okay thank you. So hi again, I'm Joey Hess, and I'm going to be talking about learning from Gen 2, which isn't what I'd originally planned to be talking about here, but there's a guy here who did something which I think is very brave. Hi. Yeah, it's Yuri in the back there. He came to DebConf wearing an at gen2.org email address. And we had some, yeah. And um, I was privileged to have some uh, very interesting talk, and hopefully more later with him. And uh, one of the things that we talked about which I thought was interesting, is the different ways that Debian and Gentoo handle um, daemons and config files. So as you know, in Debian, when you upgrade a package, you have to resolve any conflict between the new version of its config file and the old version before the daemon gets started, because it's going to be started as part of the upgrade. Um, in Gentoo, when you upgrade a package, you just get new files put on your disk. No daemon is restarted. Your old config files are left where they are, and the new one is put in a place where it can be found. And uh, could you, yeah, Gen2 has this tool called dispatch-conf, which um, handles finding the config files that are new and, res and helping you resolve the differences. And it can do things like um, ignore white space issues, ignore CVS IDs, and that kind of thing, which make it helpful if you're merging config files. And um, compared to this, I think that in some ways Debian support is fairly primitive because if we have white space issues or CVS IDs or that kind of thing in config files, we have to manually deal with that. And it, we actually tend to remove that kind of thing and try not to ship config files that contain insignificant differences. And we also, you know, we have Etsy default where we put config files for init scripts because we don't want to have to merge init scripts on upgrade and that kind of thing. Um, I, some of you, including me, may keep things like your uh, ZSHRCs or your Vim config files in your home directory instead of in Etsy because it's just too much bother to have to deal with merging them all the time. So uh, I was thinking about how can we learn from Gen2 here. Um, so I think one thing we could do is we could run dpackage with this force confold script, um, 
um, switch if you, if, uh, you wanted to and not install the new config files and then re use something like dispatch shelf conf to merge to resolve them later. It could be an option. I don't think it's something that Debian wants to do by default, but I think it'd be a great option for certain admins in certain situations. And of course, we also have invoke RC that um, invoke RC.d now, which allows you to configure a system not to start a daemon on upgrade or not to start a new install, et cetera. And it does this by this policy layer thing, which has never actually been included in Debian. It's something that we expect sysadmins to write if they really want to not start a daemon. Um, and so I, I'm thinking, well, maybe we can just package all this up together. We can put invoke rc.d, uh, I'm sorry, we can put dispatch.conf in, in a package along with some policy scripts that do things like don't start a daemon on upgrade. Or if you're, if you're installing a package with a new daemon in it, just don't start the daemon then, start it on upgrade. It depends on what you're trying to do with your system, how you might want this to work. So I think we could have lots of different interesting options there. Um, we could also do things like uh, collect a list of the demons that haven't started so you can go back after the install and manually resolve things, which I think would be great on certain types of servers. And I think there's all kinds of ideas here that we could elaborate on, but I just, you know, this is just an idea that I had and it's sort of an ITP here at DevConf. I might, I'll probably end up trying to work on this a little bit. Um, so the other thing that I wanted to mention I just think that, it's, I, I really do think that it's really brave that you came here. I think it's great. And I hope that maybe in the future we can have more developers from other distributions attend DevConf or maybe go the other way if somebody's feeling brave and wants to go to a Gen 2 conference or wants to go to a Red Hat conference or something like that. I think that would be great. I think you could learn a whole lot doing that. So that's about it. Um, so thanks for your attention and uh, hopefully somebody will do that. Thank you. Um, now I'm going to give a brief talk about uh, data mining on Debian and PEX metadata. Um, since five minutes is way too much for a talk, I'm going to do this in two minutes. Um, well, one of the problems when you want to have an overview for people uh, to look at whether uh, a list of all their packages, a um, major example is developer.php, also known as the DDPO pages. Uh, you will discover that a lot of maintainers have, yeah, are using multiple email addresses or have multiple GPG keys or alternatively have also multiple ways to write their name. So it's very hard to actually find out uh, which, how to pr um, put up a page that is really, um, how to put up a page that is really about all the packages of a given maintainer. Uh, in order to, to work on this, there is um, a small script uh, called Carnivore in the QA repository that is able to uh, look through uh, all the keyring files that is in Debian and the packages files and try smartly to actually uh, correlate the different email addresses, GPG keys, etc., with each other so that uh, developer.php could, uh, for example, use this. Um, this is going. Uh, this is currently already in use in uh, one of the QA systems, uh, the MIA system, and uh, it's not currently working yet for uh, DDPO. But I hope um, this will be able to be done uh, relatively soon. Um, yeah, it's currently not entirely accurate yet because uh, it's also trying to match on the real name. And one famous example within Debian is we have two Brian Nelsons. Uh, so it's always a trade-off how to actually do this. Um, now I want to continue about uh, talking about tracking MIA developers, where this is uh, used for. Uh, MIA developers um, is always a bit a delicate subject um, because uh, there can be all kinds of different reasons that a given developer is not uh, tending to his packages uh, very well. Uh, in order to track this, we have uh, on uh, Merkle a set of inbox files for each maintainer for which we have an indication that it might be uh, missing or simply not enough time for these packages. 
Uh, together with those mbox files, uh, we have uh, a file with uh, summary tags, uh, by which we can have assigned a sort of severity severity to a maintainer. Maybe someone is simply a little bit uh, busy and has way too many packages and it would uh, pay off for this person to often a few of his packages, but other maintainers have not been seen for two years and all the packages are in multiple NMUs, etc. Every time um, the MIA team uh, wants to actually uh, work on this. Uh, there's a script to be run that uh, is called MIA-to-do, uh, which will go through the database, looks up which um, uh, for each given uh, severity, what maintainers could need uh, a prod mail, a mail asking, hey, what's up, are you still there, how are you doing, etc. Uh, and when such a mail is sent and there's a reply coming, we can adjust the severity. Uh, accordingly and ultimately of course there is the possibility to often the packages uh, next to mia dash to do there's also mia dash query which is um, um, superseding the old mia dash history uh, script um, which is able to look up for a given maintainer in case of there is some uh, question about the maintainer uh, what's the status of that uh, together with these tools, um, I hope that the MIA team will be able to scale a bit more. It's now uh, much more possible for multiple teams to work on this, which I think is very important. You need to ensure that as, le as less uh, things as possible are done by one person. That's exactly the thing the MIA team is trying to address at some time. So it's kind of weird that the MIA team itself was uh, for quite a long time a single person effort and well through this uh, work distribution and uh, coordination um, uh, we're do getting more and more on top of uh, actually uh, finding out and also proactively uh, mailing maintainers who have maybe uh, uh, problems maintaining their packages uh, due to lack of time and not only react at the moment someone is really totally missing uh, at all already. Uh, if you're interested or have hints, etc., please email mia at qa.debian.org. Thank you. So, wow, I think we've uh, managed to man do this a little bit quicker than we expected. We have uh, three or four minutes left. And so if Jeroen still has any breath left in him, I thought we might pull him up here. Oh, really? Okay, well, I think we might pull him up here for, um, how, for his one last talk, if that's okay with you. Well, within Debian, Debian is a very worldwide distributed community. And because of that, we have very, very many different names, different cultures. And According to this, there's also pronunciation problems uh, for names. For example, my own name is really, really causing a lot of problems. I will say it uh, once for myself. Um, I'm called Jeroen van Wolfelaar. And I would actually, there, there's some different uh, cultures. I mean, Indian, uh, again, Dutch, and uh, Japanese are, yeah, very have very different sounds and I would actually like to ask you all to try to practice. <laughs> so I suggest that on the count of three we will all try to pronounce my own name. <laughs> One, two, Jeroen van Wolfenaar. <laughs> okay, we can, we can do better, we can do better I think. Let's try again. One, two, Jeroen van... Yeah, close, close. You're, you're getting better. Let's try it one more time. One, two... Jeroen van... Jeroen van Wolflaar. Thank you. And now I would like to ask Manoj. Is he in the room? Well, let's temporarily skip to... Uh, is... You need to see... Uh, could you maybe uh, pronounce your own name for us? Oh wait, my nose is first.
I would like to ask you a favor. Could you maybe pronounce your name for the audience so that we all can practice uh, a bit better? All right. Uh, I pronounce my name as Manoj Srivastav. The final A was added by my grandfather for reasons nobody knows. And it's a little bit too late to get it off because then you have to talk to the Indian bureaucracy and say that, you know, all the property we own will have to be changed over. So I'm kind of stuck with my spelling, but it is Manoj Srivastav. Well, I will try a suggestion to um, actually uh, practice this with the whole group. <laughs> so on three again. One, two, Manoj Srivastav. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Now, uh, from a, again a different uh, part of the world, uh, Japan, uh, I would like to ask you, I'm not going to try it before, <laughs> to pronounce your name. Okay, there's actually a pause between Jun and Ichi. So this is pronounced as Jun Ichi Uekawa. One, two, Jun Ichi Uekawa. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, actually, let me give me the real reason why I was actually proposing this talk. Uh, actually, I cannot really care that much how you pronounce it as long as I understand what you mean. But I just really wanted to have a whole crowd uh, cheering my name. And thank you very much for cooperating with that. And thanks, uh, thanks to Joey Hess for organizing this and introducing the Lightning Talk to DebConf. I think it's a great thing to have, and I hope this will uh, have a continuation next year. Thank you. So yeah, I completely agree. I completely agree that we should have it next year, and maybe it should be a little bit longer if you all can stand that. Um, I don't know if we have any time for questions, but if we do, here we are. <laughs> so or if anybody remembers any of the talks to ask a question about them. Hi, I have a question for Matt, and I wanted to know, all the um, uh, support requests, requests that Debian admins get are archived uh, publicly somewhere, or for security or any other reason they're kept private, that's uh, all. The list address is archived, but it's uh, a private archive, I believe. Um, and uh, I don't think the DSA address is archived. Is there any good reason why it's not public, or could we change that? Um, some Make of the requests, I think, are sensitive, but it might be the possibility that it could be opened up later on or something like that. Okay, thank you. The, the question is for Andreas. Where did you find the market share figures, if you know? I think Andreas has left the building, so... I withdraw the question. <laughs> Hello. Um, maybe I can answer uh, the question from Thaddeus. Uh, I spoke with Andreas about it. And he said he has uh, spoken with uh, some embedded developers who told him that uh, while searching for sponsoring money. Yeah, he said that uh, there was a very similar um, uh, poll on Linux devices which has um, uh, come to the same result as he got from the developer. Maybe we have time for one more question. Okay, no more questions. Well, thank you all for attending. <laughs>